got one minute. It's six o'clock, uh, 1800 for the military types. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Capital Improvement Program Joint Work Session with the City Council, Budget Committee, and Planning Commission. I'd like to call the meeting to order today, April 6, 2021. Um, can we please bring up the President of Allegiance, please? of the United States of America and to the Republic of which I stand with one nation under God, in the history of and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, roll call, please. Yes, finalist. Mayor Alex Johnson. Here. Councilor Nicholson. Here. Councilor Matilda Novak. Here. Councillor Stacy Bartholomew. Here. Councillor Ray Kopzinski. Here. Councillor Bessie Johnson. Here. Councillor Marilyn Smith. Here. And we'll move on to budget budget committee members, Jesse Brenneman. Here. Chris Hansen. Here. Colleen Keller. Here. Keith. Losey. Here. Jared Taylor. Here. Will Summers. Here. Terry Vernig. Here. And then on to Planning Commissioners, Ted Bunch Jr. Present. Carol Canham. Yeah, I can't here. talk to you now though. Um, here. Jennifer Carner Geyser. Oh, sorry. I'm Carter here. Heiser. I got you. I'm here. Diane Hunsaker. Joanne Miller. Here. Sonia Neperud. Here. Kayla Rouse. Here. Bill Riles. And Larry Tomlin. So thank you very much, Kendra. I'd like to turn the meeting over to the city manager, Peter Trotson. So Peter, uh, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mayor. And first of all, I'll just ask all of you to put your phones on mute or your computers on mute. We still have a little bit of feedback. So if you're still on, uh, even if you're on a phone calling in, try to put that on mute. So good evening, Mayor, Councilors, Budget Committee members, Planning Commissioners. Welcome to this joint work session on the important subject of Albany's Capital Improvement Program. For many of you, this will be the first time you're participating in the CIP process. So we'll take it slow and invite your questions. We're following the same format we used for the last CIP work session in 2019 with one important exception. This meeting is virtual. And because it's virtual, we have to find ways to acknowledge your questions. Without a raise the hand feature, you guys uh, are familiar with that Zoom has a raise hand feature as does Microsoft Teams. GoToMeeting does not have that feature. So without that feature, I'll ask you to type your name into the chat box if you have a question. Try to refrain from any other kind of conversation in the chat box. Just put your name there and we'll call on you. Staff will be monitoring the chat box. I will be monitoring it, and we will call on you. So this evening, city, city staff will provide an overview of each chapter, and then we'll take more questions from council and committee members. Let me start by noting that the CIP is a very important part of the city's long-range planning process. It helps us plan and prioritize investment and reinvestment in the city's infrastructure. It is both a planning tool and a way to communicate with our stakeholders how the limited resources we have will be allocated to the city's capital needs. The themes of growth, limited resources, increasing regulatory requirements, aging infrastructure, and deferred maintenance 
appear in recurring editions of the CIP going back years. What does that mean? It means we are not the first to deal with these issues. Every year, city staff try to match those scarce resources against the highest priority needs for capital investment. But while we may not be the first to deal with the issues, we are watching as the mismatch continues to increase year by year. The costs of growth and aging infrastructure are unavoidable. Our emphasis is on sound stewardship and our staff work diligently within this resource constrained environment. With the limited resources to address infrastructure needs, the stewardship of our infrastructure requires careful planning and prioritization. And inevitably, some projects can't be funded. The CIP separates funded and unfunded projects, and there are long lists of unfunded projects. You might ask, if we can't fund these projects, why, why do we show them? Well, they reflect the needs of our growing city, and at some point, they will have to be considered as the urgency of their need increases. Placing these projects in the CIP provides visibility of needs that are on the horizon. If funding subsequently becomes available, perhaps in the form of federal assistance, it can be applied in a systematic way to these projects. If there are no means of funding the projects, the Albany community needs to be aware of this too. The risk of infrastructure failures increases when we cannot properly maintain and preserve that infrastructure. The maintenance backlog is growing in streets, parks, and other infrastructure. And when maintenance is deferred or overlooked, it ultimately becomes more expensive. In some cases, but not, certainly not in all cases, the degradation of the system can lead to catastrophic results. I think you've all had an opportunity to review the draft, so you know that the CIP covers a five-year period. It's guided by the city's strategic plan, as well as public input. It provides a schedule for anticipated projects over this five-year planning window, with the projects identified in the first two years, fiscal years 22 and 23, included in the development of the budget for the next biennium. The development of the plan is coordinated between all city departments responsible for capital projects. The CIP is divided into eight main categories that each address a major infrastructure service provided by the city. Each category has a list of funded projects and an even longer list of those that are unfunded. The categories include accessibility, parks, public facilities, revitalization, stormwater, transportation, wastewater, and water. And additionally, the plan includes a community needs section that identifies major needs in Albany without a dedicated funding source, including training facilities for the fire and police departments, emergency communications systems and radios, and the backlog of parks and streets that require repair and maintenance. The anticipated project costs in each of the major categories over the next five years in this CIP is estimated to be around 68 million, made up of funding from many sources, including revenue from water and sewer rates, SDCs, state gas tax, general fund and various grants. Wherever possible, staff identify and secure alternate sources of funding and this CIP includes about five and a half million in grant funding. Because growth is a recurring and important topic, it's worth noting here the importance of systems development charges. If you are one who believes that growth should pay for itself, you should understand that SDCs are the means by which new development and construction pay for the increase in streets, water and wastewater infrastructure that comes with growth. SDCs for fire protection are not allowed in Oregon, and therefore taxpayers and ratepayers and the other uh, enterprise funds bear the cost of this growth. Without SDCs or with artificially low SDCs, existing ratepayers and taxpayers would be paying for that growth through increased rates, higher taxes, or deferred maintenance. Unfortunately, growth during previous decades has left us with the costs of infrastructure maintenance 
that now, today, must be borne by the current generation of tax of ratepayers. Albany will continue to grow in the years ahead, and the current generation of leaders has a responsibility to future citizens to make sure the city is ready to meet their needs. Part of that readiness is spreading the cost of infrastructure over time so that any one generation doesn't have to pay for benefits enjoyed over many years. In a moment, I'm gonna turn this microphone over to Stacy Belcastro, our city engineer, who is acting in capacity as our public works director as we reorganize. So let me take this opportunity to recognize and thank Stacy for her willingness to step to the plate and serve. Stacy will cover the majority of the presentation tonight. But Kim Ledane, our Parks and Recreation Director, is also here to cover the Parks section. And Seth Sherry, Economic Development Manager, is here to cover revitalization. Though Seth is without a camera tonight, our apologies for that malfunction. The Public Facilities section doesn't contain many projects other than training facilities for emergency responders. But Shane Wooten, our Fire Chief, will cover that section. And finally, you will not hear from Jeff Babbitt, our Public Works Department business manager. He's, he's kind of like uh, the Wizard of Oz behind the screen. And to him goes the lion's share of the credit for coordinating this effort. I know he's listening behind that screen, so thank you, Jeff. Again, as a reminder, questions from counselors, budget committee members, and planning commissioners are welcome. And there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion. Questions have already been submitted and Jeff Babbitt has forwarded answers to those questions in emails today and yesterday, and I hope you've had a chance to review them. The CIP is also made available for the public to review and comment on prior to its adoption. And for your information, that public hearing is scheduled for June 9th. So at this point, I've been rambling on long enough. Um, Stacy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter. And Good evening, Mayor, Councilors, and Commission members. Um, so my name is Stacey Belcastro. I'm the City Engineer in the Public Works Department. Um, as I'm going to go ahead and start with the Community Needs section. As um, City Manager Peter Trozen mentioned in his introduction, this is the section of the CIP document that identifies projects that benef benefit Albany um, as a whole, but don't necessarily have a um, adequate or dedicated funding source to construct the, the projects. Um, you know, I will mention the silver lining here is that there are projects that were identified in this section in past CIPs that we were able to secure funding for. Some of these projects were the fire and police station that were constructed um, three or four years ago, I think it's been now. And then also recently, we were able to secure a low interest loan through the, the state to construct the riverfront interceptor sewer and lift station project. Um, and Peter already mentioned that the, the, the community needs identified in this section of the C CIP include training facilities for our public safety, for fire and police, as well as trying to, to identify adequate funding for our street and stormwater infrastructure. And if there aren't any questions, and I'm not seeing any in the chat box, I can go ahead. I have the next sec section, which is the accessibility section in the CIP. Let's see. So excuse me if I look to the to the side of my screen. I do have some some notes for some of my talking points. Um, so the accessibility section, um, there's only one project that's identified in this section in the CIP. It's actually been here for a while. It's the Washington Street ADA improvements. It is planned in the upcoming biennium budget for fiscal year 2023. This project was um, initiated in response to um, Americans with Disability Act or ADA complaint that we received from a citizen requesting that sidewalks and ADA ramps be constructed on Washington Street between our downtown corridor 
and the highway. Um, this project actually is going to also have um, an overlay, a street overlay project and water and sewer improvements that are planned um, in conjunction with it for the same fiscal year. Um, even though there isn't a long list of ADA projects in this section of the CIP, we do make significant effort to address ADA throughout the city. Um, some of the projects that we've constructed are pedestrian push buttons for those audi auditory improvements um, at the traffic signal at Waverly and Queen. This was in response to a request from a um, vision group um, in the community. And then we are also planning to install similar improvements to the traffic signal at Hickory in response to concerns that were raised by residents of the Bonaventure living facility. Um, ADA is also considered with every one of our capital projects and privately constructed projects during the past two years. We have improved 68 ramps in, in conjunction with capital projects. And um, lastly, I wanted to mention that Public Works is in the process of completing an ADA self-evaluation and transition plan. So we are assessing um, barriers in the right-of-way for accessibility. Um, we're looking at crosswalks, sidewalks, ramps, traffic signals, transit stops, and parking. Um, this effort will result in a, a list of prioritized, a prioritized list of projects with cost estimates that um, will likely be found in future editions of the CIP. Stacey, can you take a break for a question from uh, Mayor Johnson? Absolutely. Actually, Stacey, thank you. You just answered it. I was going to, I don't know how to retract that. So I was going <laughs> to ask, are you proactively going after or looking for ADA um, fixes throughout the city? And just, you just answered that question. So thank you. Oh, all right, great, thanks. And uh, Stacy, it looks like uh, Councillor Olson is waving his hand, so I think he may have a question. Okay. Uh, do you plan to cut down a bunch of trees on Washington Street for this project? We street will. Street. Oh, we will do our best. So, with with all of our our capital projects, we do an assessment of the the street trees. We look at them with the city forester with the parks department and um, we tr try to avoid cutting down trees as much as possible well it seems like every time you do a project you cut down most of the trees and i i personally object yeah we will try to save as many of the trees as possible and and in those cases where where it's unavoidable we try to plant new trees to replace the ones well, yeah, but the, the tree you plant today takes decades to become anything that's worth much of anything. That's true. Thanks, Stacey. I don't see any other questions if you want to continue. Okay. I actually think the next, that's all for accessibility unless there's further questions. And so I would turn it over to um, Director Kim Ledane with the Parks and Recreation Department. Can't hear you. You're not coming across. You might want to check the which which microphone you're using. No. And Stacy, um, we can, while we wait for Kim, we can move on to the next session. You can give her a few minutes to troubleshoot. Sure. The, the next um, chapter in the CIP is public safety. So that would be Fire Chief Shane Wooten. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, good deal. Well, good evening, Mayor, Council, Budget Committee, Planning Commission members. My name is Shane Wooten, and I'm the Fire Chief of Albany Fire Department. 
we have uh, four items uh, in the plan, and I'll just go through each one. Three, the first three have been on previous plans, so I can give you an update where we sit on those. And then the last one was one that I've added since I became chief that's near and dear to me uh, and, and hopefully important to you as well. So first off, uh, the first item on there is the Station 12 training grounds. Now, council heard during your retreat that behind Station 12, and for those of you that don't know, Station 12 is on 34th Avenue, our training grounds are back there, well, or behind the station. Well, that area is also shared with uh, with all the city buses, uh, the transit buses. So it gets pretty congested back there and there isn't a lot of space. It also requires us to coordinate our training with the current transit routes because as they come in, we can't have hose on the ground to be able to uh, do our evolutions is what they're called. Um, because the buses have to come in and have to exchange drivers. Another thing that that area, or so one of the items that we're looking at is uh, working with uh, Director Bailey, what can we do to potentially move the buses to a different location? Uh, currently, her and I have been talking a few times this last week about some potential grants that might be out there. So we'll uh, continue to work down those avenues, looking for additional sources of revenue to try to maybe move those buses. The other piece that doesn't really have, uh, that we're really not sure how to make this happen is the construction of a drill tower. So what a drill tower is, if you think about going by maybe a fire station, or if you're in a small community, you'll see a tower that elevates usually four or five stories above wherever the fire station is at. Well, that is used, or the firefighters use that to train. We practice repelling out the windows. We practice if somebody is outside a third story window, how are we gonna get our ladder up there to get them out? Well, the city of Albany doesn't have a training tower. Uh, we had one in the old Station 11, but that was uh, demolished and there wasn't funds to, to erect one uh, in its replacement. So up to now, what we've been doing since Station 11's construction is we've been partnering with Corvallis Fire Department as well as Polk County Fire District, and we've been using their training tower. While that works in the short run, that's not really a long-term solution as we get busier and busier, having units out of town isn't a good solution. So the next item is updating our radio system. So currently, uh, and I don't want to geek out on you with radio talk, and I'm actually probably not the right one to do that anyway, uh, but uh, currently we have what is called the VHF system. It is an older, uh, it's an older form of radio communications where uh, other jurisdictions, other areas, and including our police department operate on what's called a digital system. Uh, so, what ultimately that we need to be planning for in the future is we will eventually have to switch from our old VHF system to a digital radio system. Uh, what we've done since the last time that this came before, at least some of you, is uh, we hired a contractor to, a consultant to look at our radio system. And when I say our radio system, I mean all of Lynn County's fire agencies. Uh, for those of you new to uh, hearing me talk or really any fire chief talk, uh, we are heavily reliant on all of our partners around us, all the different fire departments. And so it's important that our radio communications are the same, uh, that we're able to communicate with Lebanon Fire, Corvallis Fire, and all of us are still on this VHF system. So it's going to be a huge undertaking to be able to switch everybody over to that digital system. The consultant we hired gave us some recommendations on how we can bolster up our current radio system. And though we're working through some of those items right now. For the council, if you remember, probably about two months ago, I brought to you that we were going to use equipment replacement funds to replace some of our portable rate or handheld radios. That's all part of us trying to improve our existing system. Shane. The or, I'm sorry, go ahead break for a question from Terry Vernig. Yes, Mr. Vernig. 
I'm just wondering how unique Albany is in not having one of these training towers. Is that something that is commonplace for cities the size of Albany? And what is the possibility of partnering with other cities to use one of those? So, uh, to be honest with you, I'm unaware of any city our size without a training tower. Uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, if I were to go out and to, you know, really scour the earth, there, there probably is somebody out there that doesn't. But jurisdictions of most all, or most jurisdictions have a training tower. And it's something that, that we need to do. Uh, eventually. As far as partnering, that's something that we're already trying to do in the interim, is partnering with the city of Corvallis and Polk County Fire District to be able to use theirs. Lebanon has one as well, uh, which I'm sure they'd be more than willing to allow us to, to use that. But again, that takes units out of town and out of service for us to be able to go and do that training. All right, did I, any other questions out there? I'm sorry about, I started rambling and I didn't look over at the... Don't worry, I'll interrupt you. Uh, Mr. Hansen. Yeah, thank you. I was I didn't see a, a cost of the training tower in the CIP, and I was wondering what the total cost was when you combine it with the cost of moving the school buses. And have you looked at, uh, have you compared the total cost of creating it to the cost of sharing, say with Corvallis and maybe more overtime or whatever that it would take. Yeah, no, we, we have not done a full analysis uh, to that extent. And those are some of the things that, that we absolutely need to do and, and would do before that we bring anything to the council as far as the decision goes. Uh, the the $2.5 million that you uh, see in there is, uh, our best, well, actually, with, with all these items in here, it's our best estimation of what the cost would be to do the entire project. Uh, so in regards to specifically what that drill tower would look like, uh, more research is needed because you can do all sorts of variations of that. You can, there are, and we've actually done a little bit of research and in, in seeing uh, if we could use uh, some of the National Guard folks to maybe erect a tower for us because they can be built from wood, they can be built from concrete, block. Uh, so there's all sorts of variations uh, that could affect the cost. So that was a roundabout way, uh, Mr. Hansen, of saying I don't have a specific answer for you on, on those questions. More work needs to be done on that still. Okay, uh, so moving along in the digital radio system, uh, I'll, actually I'll move on to the next one to Fire Station 12 asphalt replacement. The asphalt back there is over 30 years old. It's had fire trucks and buses on it for some time. And uh, here in the near future, we'll need to look at uh, putting money into uh, replacing that asphalt and improving it. The last item is uh, gender neutral locker rooms. And let me give you a little bit of background of, of what this project is. So uh, we own, or we have four fire stations. Actually, Albany Fire Department operates out of five, but the city owns four. Station 13 and 14, so the station over by Three Lakes Road and the one in North Albany were built in 1998. Uh, they were constructed for the workforce at the time. So there is a, a larger male locker room with a larger capacity and a female locker room, which just has room for one female employee at a time. Well, at the time in 1998, only 2% of the nation's professional firefighters were women. So really, I mean, just pathetically low. And uh, unfortunately, that number's only come up to about 4% now, but I'm happy to say Albany Fire Department, we're over 8%. So you could probably see where I'm going with this, that the facilities might have been built in, the facility size might have been appropriate in 1998, but it's not for the changing workforce. 
So what we did when we constructed Station 11 is we built pods. So it's just one big large locker room with lockers, but people grab their uniforms and they go into this pod that has a shower and a toilet and a sink. And so then when you build the station that way, it doesn't matter the ratio of male to female or, or in anything else. Uh, everybody has equal facilities. They are um, not only equal facilities, but it also provides privacy for people. And, and it turns out the idea of old locker rooms isn't as popular now, and everybody appreciates a little bit of privacy. So uh, Millersburg is building a fire station that we operate out of. We've worked with Millersburg to have that station uh, designed with this pod concept that is able to grow and change with the workforce. Well, station uh, 13 and 14 need to be updated to, uh, to the times, I guess, for, for lack of, of better uh, words. So that hasn't been on our, in our CAP before, but it was something important to me as chief, and I wanted to get in front of you for the first time. And uh, like with all these items, we're continually looking for funding. Uh, none of them are funded, uh, but that won't stop us from, uh, from working to find some sort of solution. So with that, that ends my piece, unless there's questions and I'm looking in the chat and I don't see any. But if you do have questions down the road, do not hesitate to call me, uh, email me, text me, however you want to reach out to me and ask, and we'll get you an answer. It, it looks like Parks Director Kim Ledane is ready to present. Oh, no. She said one second. <laughs> yeah, we still. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe we'll move on to um, the the revitalization section um, with Seth Sherry. And, and before yeah, we, Stacey. Oh, Seth, before we do that, it sounds it looks like Will Summers has a question. Uh, I did, and the, trying to get my chat to go to everyone and be able to have my microphone on at the same time. And okay, this is always a trip. But um, going back to the fire station, uh, to the fire chief, uh, you're talking about updating current radio systems. Uh, are there national uh, grants available to help? Uh, local areas be able to afford this uh, and is the two million dollars Albany specific or the total system specific uh, estimate cost okay so to answer your question uh, yes there are grants that we can try to get uh, to that dollar amount is specific to Albany the actual overall cost for Lynn County or the Lynn County Fire Agencies to make the switch, the estimation from the consultant was upwards of $15 million. Uh, so very, very uh, uh, expensive to make that jump. I mean, for, for all of us during these times. Mm. And you know, another thing, Mr. Summers, that uh, we've even talked about, you know, if we could, you know, work with Representative DeFazio to maybe work through the appropriations process. I mean, any sort of idea that we could try to do to uh, to to get it done, uh, we're up for it. And we're we're finally just now because we have this third party consultant able to answer more specific questions on what our needs were. Up to this point, it was anecdotal and not really analytical, uh, but now we have actually the data we need to proceed and start looking at other options. Thank you. Okay, Seth, back to you. 
Sure. Thank you, Peter and Mayor, Councilors, and the Budget Committee and Planning Commission. Thank you guys for um, joining us this evening. Uh, I, I apologize. So I'm Seth Sherry. I'm the Economic Development Manager, and I apologize I couldn't join you with video tonight. But um, I would be happy to talk you through this section on revitalization and answer any questions that you might have. What you'll see if you've participated in this process before is um, some pretty familiar text in this section. And in large part, it's used to explain how our tax increment finance district works and what its purpose is. And I, I use a technical term there, and you all know it by the term of CARA, the name of CARA. And uh, again, I'm happy to meet with any of you individually, talk about some of the functionality there. But essentially, it uh, uses a portion of assessed value within a certain part of the city to reinvest back into that part of the city. In this case, it's really the downtown core and the outlying neighborhoods. What's kind of unique about the CIP section for revitaliz revitalization is uh, we get to celebrate a little bit of some of the projects that have happened to date. And you'll also note that there is a, a, you know, a long list of unfunded projects as well. And what I would let you know if you, if you were not aware that those projects come specifically from the 2001 CARA plan. That was the plan that was informed by community input to devise what the purpose and priorities of our uh, TIF district would be moving forward. So from that list of projects, we can easily say what has been accomplished and paid for and what has not. And in this case, you'll notice, although it's a fairly long list, I'm happy to report to you that uh, many of those projects, some ne nearly 13 of those are actually being planned for as we speak. And this is uh, captured within what you've seen and heard about with respect to the waterfront project. It's not a singular project, but it's a fairly comprehensive approach to revitalizing the waterfront portion of the city to do two things. One, to make it a safer and better and more active space for current mm. members of the community and those who are visiting, but also create an environment where private investment can happen into the future without the assistance or partnership of CARA. And um, right now, they're still listed as unfunded because the full funding plan is not fully fledged, but I'm also happy to report with you to you that Gina Yeager, our finance director, and myself have been working on um, the various details along with years of planning to make sure that we can fund and pay for the planned improvements. And as an aside to that, uh, if you're interested, the waterfront project, we're working with a consultant to do the design and engineering work on that. The same group who's done many waterfront projects around the state. We're, somewhere between 30 and 60% design and engineered plans for that. And we anticipate having fully engineered plans by this coming winter and construction could start as soon as 2022 summer. So with that, I'm sorry, I can't see if there's questions, but I'm happy to answer any that may uh, exist. Hey, Seth, I don't see any questions. Okay, well, feel free to shoot me a note or call me anytime you have questions around economic development or any of the urban renewal CARA stuff. Thanks for your time this evening. Thanks, Seth. Stacy, they say that the third time's a charm. Let's see. Did it work? Computer number two, I apologize. It wouldn't be a meeting these days without some sort of technical glitch. So, um, good evening. My name is Kim Ladane. I'm the director of Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, so in looking through our CIP projects, um, as you can see, we have three that are th hopefully on the funded list and uh, several, several, several that are on the unfunded list. Um, just in general, many of these projects were identified back in our 2006 um, master plan for replacement and development. Um, but unfortunately due to our finances, uh, that has not been the case. And so, when we tried to look forward to figure out, okay, how do we use the resources that we have to do the most good? Um, we 
finalized a, a few projects that we are, are hopeful for. So I will walk you through those. Uh, the first one is the Henderson Park Playground. Henderson Park is a, um, a lovely little park off of Kalapuya. Um, it is our oldest park with um, very antiquated uh, play features out there. It's not necessarily inclusive. It's not ADA friendly. Um, and in fact, it's all of the old school uh, metal slides, which have been out of favor for a while. So um, we are hoping that we will be able to um, use those additional funds to go in and redo that playground. Uh, typically playgrounds have about a 30 year shelf life and a lot of ours are over that. Um, and at this point, it's just uh, unfortunately a potential liability that is out there that we feel we need to, to take the steps forward and, and um, go ahead and update that. So um, the impact, um, as far as additional impact, it'll actually make our staff more efficient as they will not have to be out there as much for repair and doing assessments. Uh, as the equipment will be newer and hopefully will uh, not only provide a more enjoyable recreation experience, but also a better environment for our staff. Any questions about Henderson Park? I was out there this weekend at Excellent Adventure and it was frequented by quite a few kiddos. So it was, it was nice to see. All right, our second project is the Timber Ridge Park development. Um, we, the Parks Department, um, brought on this piece of property a few years ago as it's between the elementary school and the middle school over there. And there is a ton of growth going on on the east side of town, but at this point we only have one park to serve that whole area and that's uh, Timberland. And while that park is large, it isn't necessarily meeting the needs of that community over there. And so the goal is to be able to put in a brand new playground um, at that space with, uh, with it in mind that we need to be very sensitive to the amount of maintenance that goes into it, as unfortunately we don't have, um, you know, we, we won't be getting a lot more staff to help with, with adding additional acreage. Um, and so we've gotten a design plan on it. Um, we worked with the school district. If we are able to find funds that we feel like we would be able to maintain it moving forward, then we would like to move forward with actual construction in 2022. All right, and then our third project is Deerfield Park Playground. Um, it is also an, an older playground system. There's lots of opportunity at Deerfield as it is a ton of space. In our master plan, it was identified as one of the parks that we could uh, get the most bang for our buck out there with redeveloping, making it a multi-generational uh, recreation space. And we feel like that's really important for our community. And so the hope is that we will be able to move forward um, and, and do some redevelopment out there. So that, that way it's, it's, it's being used um, and it becomes a vital part of the community down there. Because it's such a, a larger space, um, as you can see, it, it has some additional costs associated with it outside of, um, unlike uh, Henderson, which has a smaller price tag. And then if you go down to the unfunded projects, as I mentioned before, um, many, many of these have been on the list for the last 15 years. Um, especially the equipment replacement projects down at the bottom, Grand Prairie, Draper Park, Pineway, and Lehigh. If we were lucky enough to be able to move forward with the CIP projects we have on the list currently, um, and we were able to get some additional grant dollars, we would certainly be looking to check some of those off the list. Um, we we are, are writing more and more grants these days, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, to receive one for a larger project at some point. As for park development, uh, Timberland Park, as I mentioned earlier, is currently our only park on the east side of town. It has a master plan associated with it. Um, as you can see, those improvements are very costly. Um, and so it'll it'll be some time probably before we're ever, ever able to tackle that. As well as community park development, um, as, as the community continues to grow, especially on the south side and the east side, there are additional opportunities to add parks so we can, we can serve people. Um, and so while, uh, while that need is not here quite yet, we need to make sure that we have it on our horizon so that when the time comes, uh, we're able to address it and hopefully find funding to accommodate. That is all I have. Is there anything, are there any questions that I'm able to answer? Looks like, uh, looks like uh, Will might have another question. I do. Uh, Mr. Ken, Summers. <clears throat> thank you. Um, do you require new developments uh, if they're going 
more than just one or two houses at a time, but newer developments to provide green space or parks in their plan and to be built by the developer as they're making those properties into homes? Yes, green space is built into the requirements. However, those can sometimes be challenging as they aren't necessarily open to the public. And that can be confusing for folks as they see a playground, um, it doesn't have a fence around it and they wanna go have fun. But if they're not necessarily a part of that community, it can cause some issues. And so despite the fact that those green spaces are available, they don't necessarily meet the needs that, that we need to address as a city. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Jennifer Kaiser. Um, yes, thank you. I was actually wondering, um, have you guys ever, and I'm this may be, have been already covered years ago, so I'm new to this, so first off, but um, what about uh, business sponsorships for some of the unfended replacement projects? I love that idea, and it is definitely one that if we had an organization that was interested, we would be thrilled to talk uh, talk to them. Um, we're discussing a little bit more potentially capital campaigns moving forward, especially partnering with the Parks and Recreation Foundation. Um, and so that's something that we're, that we're looking to do. And fingers crossed, hopefully we'll find somebody. Yeah, I, I mean, I think when we look at overall, um, I know, for example, I'll just use Brookdale. They have three of their communities right next to Grand Prairie. What a wonderful advertisement to put up a bulletin board and obtain the funds to do that on behalf of so just some thoughts that's great thank you very much you're very Thanks. welcome here johnson uh, the question i have is i know we're looking to possibly liquidate a couple of parks in the future would some of that revenue be used to can we use some of that resume revenue to do some of this work the plan is if we do liquidate those parks, we'll be able to start addressing the $5 million backlog. So yes, those funds would go towards projects like this. All right, thank you. That's all I need to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Johnson? Yes, Kim, I was wondering, with the Timber Ridge uh, Park property, you know, that doesn't include the purchase of the park. We've already got that covered, right? Correct. Okay, how, how big is this park? It seems like, um, well, how big is it, do you know? It's fairly small. I believe it's 1.8 acres. Um, and so that's the reason why we're even considering it. If it was any larger and would take more maintenance, uh, we wouldn't yeah. be able to. Um, so I guess, it's fairly small. Yeah, my my question is, is you know, $1.185 million is, that's a lot of money. And I was just wondering um, if we just keep it to, you know, making the park and putting some playground equipment, is it going to come up to that $1 million or is that a, uh, an overestimate? Sure, great question. It is an overestimate. It's what the number was used when we did our master plan. They looked at typical park development of costs per acre um, across the state. And so um, when we originally budgeted for it, I believe in the last time around, it was about $500,000. Um, but we, the to make sure infrastructure and all that stuff is in place, uh, when MIG put together the cost estimate, it came in higher, but I don't anticipate we would spend that much. Okay, thank you. Which Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but that would mean that basically you would value, quote unquote, value engineer the project and not and just not fund as many amenities in that project. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, Terry has another question. Yeah, this, uh, this question is kind of broad based, I guess, because it would go across to these different uh, departments. And, so, and I don't know where to, where to put it in. It, it probably applies as much to transportation as any, but it would definitely, I think, go across. The, my question is, how does the new infrastructure bill affect our budget? And primarily with CIP, uh, does it help anywhere in this system where we're hurting so much for funding? That's a that's a really good question, a really big question, and a question whose answer is unknown at this time. I, I don't I don't even 
you, I, I assume you're talking about the two point two trillion dollar uh, infrastructure bill that is currently making its way through uh, Washington. Yeah, clarification. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, that won't be. You know, it's certainly it's on our horizon, but I don't even think Stacy has has information on what would be in that for individual cities or how it would be broken up, if it would be broken up functionally. Uh, or geographically. So it's just a little bit too early to tell. If anybody has any other questions, I'd love to talk with you more about it. Um, feel free to get in contact with me. Uh, and thank you very much again for the opportunity to present and hope you have a great night. All right, and so I think I have the last four sections that I'll provide the overview of, and I'm going to start with stormwater. So the you'll see in looking at the stormwater section, and oh, by the way, if anybody wanted to look at the CIP document, I, I can try to, to share my screen, but I, I think up until now that really hasn't been, been necessary, but, but that option is available. Um, so you'll see that the stormwater section, it does not yet include a list of funded or unfunded projects. We are still in the process of assessing the Albany storm system. And then we are also working on an update to the stormwater master plan, which is very close to being completed. I expect staff will be presenting the document to council probably in the next couple of months is what we're expecting. Um, so the next CIP that will be issued in, in two years will likely include, will, it will include a list of projects um, that will be identified during our, our assessment when we complete our assessment of the storm drain system and then also um, in the updated stormwater master plan. Um, I will point out though that similar to the ADA section, even though there isn't a long list of projects identified in this section, we still are making significant efforts in Albany to address stormwater improvements. Now, you know, with, with um, in conjunction with other street capital projects and in our projects that are identified in the CIP. Um, the other um, thing to mention with the stormwater section is DEQ has finalized the revised municipal separate storm sewer system permit. We call this our MS4 permit. Um, Albany will be required to apply for this permit within the next month. And then there will be significant costs associated with meeting the requirements that are outlined in that permit. And they are anticipated to occur during the five year window of this CIP. Are there any questions? I don't see any, so I will go ahead and move on to the transportation section. Um, you know, similar to past CIPs, a lot of the projects, the major street projects that are identified in this chapter are primarily arterial and collector streets. This is consistent with the objective adopted in Albany's strategic plan, which is to maintain arterial and collector streets in a better or fair condition. Um, however, this CIP also includes the introduction of a new project or program. It's called the Asphalt Surface Treatment Program. There are funds included in this program in each year of the CIP. It, it varies by fiscal year, just based on available funding. Um, what this program is intended to do is complete surface treatments on local streets um, using technology such as slurry seal. So um, slurry seal is something that we haven't done for many years. We did recently award a slurry seal project in the, I think it was the Lehigh neighborhood, and um, hope to, to be able to address more local streets in the future using this program. Um, the other thing I want to point out is 
you may see that there are a number of streets in, identified, including 34th Avenue, Salem Avenue, and 5th Avenue. So these streets were reconstructed as part of the um, most recent street bond that was passed. That was back in 1998. So um, these streets are over 20 years old. What we did back then is we invested in um, constructing a, with the full street re reconstruction, we constructed a, a good structure so that in 20 years, we could do a grind off the top two inches of asphalt, um, do an overlay and inlay two new inches and basically reset the, the clock, um, which provides another 20 plus years of life for these streets. Um, and, and the last thing I want to point out is that, that staff has done a great job during the past couple of years in working with our state in identifying grants. And um, there's a number of projects in this section of the CIP where we were able to leverage over $5 million in grant funding to construct projects using only $500,000 in city funds. And, and we will continue to do that to, to try to to get as much work done on our street infrastructure as possible. <clears throat> and I think I see that Councillor Marilyn Smith, oh, it is the Lexington neighborhood. Thanks for that clarification, Marilyn, that, that we're doing our slurry seal project on this summer. Were there any other questions? I don't see any. I will go ahead and move on to the wastewater section. So the, the projects in the, this, this section include our collection system rehabilitation projects. Um, this includes rehabbing lines using trenchless construction methods, primarily based on condition assessments of the wastewater system. Um, there are also a number of sewer replacement projects in this section that are being constructed in conjunction with street improvements. And then I also want to call out that there are three major facility projects in this CIP. Um, phase two and phase three of the Cox Creek interceptor sewer, and then also the Ferry Street interceptor sewer project is planned for years, I guess it's years one, one, four, and five. So these are high priority projects. They were identified in our wastewater collections facility plan that was completed recently. Um, they're going to help eliminate sanitary sewer overflows and address capacity. The, the third phase of the Cox Creek project, it's going to include extending the sewer line to the east side of I-5, and, and this is really important because it's going to, to help facilitate development in that area. We also, I guess I wanna point out that we are continuing our sewer lateral replacement program. That program has been very popular, um, Albany's unique in, in Oregon and probably in the Northwest in that we have funds every fiscal year where we, um, work with property owners um, to assess their lines to see they, they apply for the program and if they have a qualifying sewer lateral on private property that is contributing to INI, the city um, facilitates replacement of that line. So it benefits property owners and it also benefits the city by eliminating um, inflow and infiltration into the sewer system. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, Will Summers. Yeah, I was noticing the uh, some of the Queen Avenue uh, projects that you've got listed uh, shows going from the uh, Highway 99 over to Marion Street. Will that project uh, caused the railroad to uh, improve the 
tracks where they cross uh, Queen Avenue while you're you're doing the infrastructure project? Yeah, um, ODOT Rail is um, working with Union Pacific, and they are going to be constructing some safety improvements and replacing that crossing on Queen Avenue. And so we are scheduling the, the Queen Avenue rehabilitation project that the city's doing to occur after that those improvements are done so that we can tie into the new rail crossing. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Um, the last section of the CIP is water. Um, this section includes typical water replacement projects. Um, you know, I guess I wanna point out that one of the projects, the water line replacement that's going to be happening in the Monteith Historic District. Um, this is on Washington Street, Ferry Street and Kalapuya Street. There's actually water lines that are over a hundred years old. Um, I can't remember the exact year that they were constructed, but um, the city really did get a lot of return on their, their investment with, with those water lines. Councillor Kabzinski? Yes, uh, Stacy. the last time we dug up, happened to dig up some hundreds plus year old water lines, if I remember right, they were the old wood uh, wrapped cable type water lines. I'm wondering if a piece of that could possibly be saved for the uh, museum, if we run across any of those. You know, we were just talking about that today. So so we at one point did have a water line with a wood plug that um, we kept up here in public works. And, you know, we're always looking for, you know, we're kind of nerds that way, um, interesting infrastructure. So certainly if we find anything, I would love to get a pipe that actually has a year on it. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Fun to explore. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that's the, the water line projects are pretty typical. We do have some facility projects that'll take the vine water treatment plant in the the out the late years in the CIP. And we're gonna be replacing the, the filter media in two phases at, at Vine and then also um, recoding the maple reservoir. There's also some projects on the Santa Am Albany Canal. Um, one of the projects is going to be extending the, the bank repair that was done adjacent to the Vine Street water treatment plant. Um, I think that happened five or six years ago. We're going to be doing a couple more blocks upstream to, to, um, to do a bank repair there. The, the banks in the, the stretch of the canal that, that leads to the Kalapuya River tend to be very, very steep and susceptible to, to failure. So we want to get that section of the canal shored up. Stacy, uh, Marilyn has a request in the chat for some clarification. Oh, okay. So there is a project, the Wishram Eagle View Waterline Project. It's going to be replacing four and six inch AC water line. This is a um, water lines that are located um, outside city limit. And so they are um, going to be paid for with um, funds that are collected in the North Albany Water Capital Fund. And what this fund is, is that um, water customers that are located outside the city limit that were part of the North Albany um, County Water District that the city incorporated years back. They're charged an additional fee. I believe it's like $3.19, but I could have, I, I don't know the exact dollar amount. But um, in addition to their water bill, they're charged this sum and that these funds are um, dedicated to making capital improvements to these water lines that are located outside of the city limits. Um, the water line itself ties into the main on Scenic Drive. <clears throat> okay. 
Any other questions for Stacy? All right. Well, I, I guess uh, all those questions that came in and Jeff Babbitt's answers were very uh, effective. It looks like Terry Terry has another question. And then Bessie. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You're probably getting tired of hearing me. Um, I, I, I just wanted to go back to this infrastructure question. I was wondering, uh, and this probably be to you, um, Manager Crescent, is it possible that, that we might, you know, appoint a lead person, a champion to uh, be proactive and in, in assessing and and uh, perhaps laundering what this this uh, infrastructure bill could do for us? It just seems to me like we're talking infrastructure here. This is a huge potentially impact uh, for us to take advantage of. Sure, absolutely, and and we. Uh have on the uh, leadership team at the city have talked about this for a while now. But when I say this, it's not the infrastructure bill, it's the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, which was which actually was passed about a month ago and actually does have dedicated funding specifically for the city of Albany to the tune of about $9.3 million. But on top of that, it has funding available for airports, funding available for restaurants, funding available for nonprofits and, and medical and health enterprises, uh, and the list goes on and on. So yes, we are we are definitely looking at that. Um, do we have, we don't have a dedicated person to a person to dedicate to that. Uh, we just lost the person that we would have in, in, the, in the form of our deputy city manager. But I keep my eye on it and the leadership team keeps their eyes on it as well. So we, uh, we're all about using OPM other people's money. So, <laughs> okay, uh, Councillor Johnson. Yeah, and Stacy, I apologize for uh, not remembering this, but on any of the projects that we have in North Albany, uh, I think Kim had mentioned something about, uh, uh, well, someone did about the ADA on Hickory, and then we're going to do. Um, asphalt or some sort of uh, project in North Albany between Highway 20 and the road track. Is any of that been the county's responsibility or have they been turned over to us? I cannot remember. Um, you know, a number of the, we do have an IGA with Benton County that, that defines what streets the city is responsible for and what street Benton County is responsible for. Um, the city has taken over ownership of most of like what you would consider a local street, but uh -huh. a lot of the major streets such as Gibson Hill Road, Crocker Lane, Valley View, Spring Hill, Scenic, th those still fall under the jurisdiction of Benton County. We, we do try to work closely with their staff and meet, you know, at least, you know, once, twice a year to, to talk about um, roads up in Benton County, um, and so so Benton County would be responsible for for ADA improvements or street improvements on their roads. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, Chris just uh, said that North Albany Road is Albany's responsibility, so that was one of them. But you know, because you know, anytime we can at least split the costs helps in any way. So thank you. Okay, let me, uh, I want to remind people that, you know, we have these public meetings laws, and since we can't, we can't record what goes on in the chat system, the reason that I asked you to, to just give your name is so that we can get the, the question um, uh, written, or not written, uh, spoken, so that we can record it. So it's not the end of the world, we'll just, if you put a question in there that's written, I'm just going to ask you to, uh, to go ahead and repeat it. So, and I think I missed... I think I missed Jared Taylor as a question. Yeah, sure. so on uh, um, page 80, I was noticing that the Fifth Avenue overlay uh, has a projected total of zero dollars in the unfunded section. And I'm kind of curious with everything else unfunded having totals, why why zero dollars on that specific item? Excuse me, I'm looking for that. On, on page 80, did you say? And yes, he said 80. And while you look for that, Stacy, let me just uh, uh, tell everybody, I think you've seen the chat, but that um, uh, 
Chief Wooden has reported that a training tower represents uh, one of the $2.5 million total amount for a training facility. We've got another request here. Give Stacy a little more time to uh, look up page 80. Um, Marilyn, you had a comment. But you're on mute, though. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Marilyn. Sorry, here I am. Um, I just wanted to point out what a valuable um, document the CIP is in general. There's so much information in it. It's really helpful to have that available when members of the public ask questions about, what are you ever gonna do about this? And why haven't you thought about that? It's there. This plan memorializes that we know there are problems out there all over town with streets and water lines and sewer lines and crumbling um, slides and whatnot. It's, we know that's there. We write it down, we make a list. Eventually we get to it. Some things we'll never get to, maybe. Maybe we will if, if there's a godsend from somewhere. But the facts are memorialized in this document. And what's also memorialized there is that it costs a fortune to keep up all of the things that we're responsible for keeping up. We're getting to them as we can. We're trying to do the worst first. And um, I, I just wanna let people know if, if you get questions from your neighbors and friends or constituents or anybody, refer them to this document. Help them, it's well explained, it's easy to get through. And the type is really small, but if you're looking for the name of your street or your, your neighborhood, you're gonna find it in there. And you're gonna find that it, that we have plans for it, we'll get to it, or we at least know that there's a problem there and eventually, it, it's, we don't want those problems to get lost. My, my stump speech is finished. Stacy, back to you. All right, so so Fifth Avenue, that, that's incorrect. So the project isn't a zero dollar, dollar project. So so we will update that. If it if it costs nothing, we would be doing that project for sure. Right. I was more so like looking at it from the perspective of I know how bad that street is from that that area of, of town, and uh, it would be very curious to understand what the what the cost is projected to replace or to preserve the uh, the asphalt there. Yeah, we will get that updated in the final document. Thanks, Stacy. It looks like uh, Chris Hansen has a question. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Stacy, do you know if when if when uh, North Albany Road does get improved or repaired, will it include curbs and sidewalks on the north side of the road? Um, Mr. Hansen, are you referring to Gibson Hill Road or? Probably, I get confused where they where they change names. Um, um. I'm probably talking about Gibson Hill, which is county controlled still, right? Yes, Gibson Hill Road between Scenic Drive and where it ties into North Albany Road. That's yeah, still, yes, it's still under the Benton County's jurisdiction. Um, they are required to improve that road as part of the, the IGA, the intergovernmental agreement that the city has with Benton County. Um, those improvements were supposed to happen this summer. Um, we were just recently notified that they're going to have to delay them a year or two. Um, and they do, to answer your question, the project will include construction of, of sidewalk along that corridor. Do we have any leverage to over the county to for them to fund that sooner? For a, I mean, I think there's safety hazard or safety issues with the increased traffic there and in the really short shoulder and the trash cans get parked there. And so the bike lane basically becomes where the trash cans are put. It'd be nice to get that taken care of. We, we um, public work staff will, will be coming to probably a future council work, work session with Benton County staff to, to discuss that project and to just discuss their schedule to see if, if there's not an, a way to expedite the, the project. Um, the road's in really bad condition, so, so to see if there's some interim improvements that the county can do. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, I see no other questions. And uh, Stacy, any last comments? Closing? Are you uh, anything else? Um, you know, I guess I'll just thank everyone for their time and for 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 looking at the document. It it is a long document, um, but like Marilyn said, it it really does a good job of um, demonstrating you know the the work that we do and also the work that needs to be done in our city. Um, you know, Peter thanked um, Jeff Babbitt at the beginning of the meeting, and I would like to also thank um, you know Jeff Babbitt for. Um, our business manager, Jeff Babbitt, for putting this document together. And then also just all the staff across the city departments that, that work on it. It really is a group effort. Um, and then for me, I, I do need to particularly thank engineers, Chris Serpuski and Lori Schumacher. They do a lot of work um, to help write the scope and develop the cost estimates for the project. All right. Okay. Thank you, Stacey. And and the only comments I had I've already made, and that was about the uh, American Rescue Plan Act and what the uh, the potential for for help coming from that quarter. And we'll be we'll be embarking on an effort to uh, try to engage uh, community input on that. And uh, you'll hear more about that in the near future. Um, it provides certainly provides a study in how um how best to use one-time funds and uh, we'll be we'll be talking more about that soon and jared is slipping in under the wire with the last minute question sorry i had to do i was trying to figure out a better time to, to ask this but one of the things um that i noticed was explained within the cip was general obligation bonds and revenue bonds but i noticed that none of the projects actually have those funding sources listed as something that's potentially being pursued are there plans to pursue general obligation bonds or revenue bonds for uh, any of the unfunded projects that are on the list currently? And uh, if so, uh, is there any way for us to have visibility on kind of timelines on when we would be pursuing those from a city perspective? Stacy, do you want to take that or do you want Gina Yeager to take that? And I don't know if Gina's still on, but. Yeah, I, you know, I, don't know you know we have you know spoken at council meetings as i think as early recently as like a couple years ago about going out for a general obligation bond to address um street street maintenance issues and um ended up it did not get get a, approved um you know we will likely maybe sometime in the future i i just don't know if this is the the right right time to, to be going out. It's something that our policymakers would have to discuss. And, you know, we would certainly, um, you know, go ahead and, and, and report to council if that was something that was of an interest. Gina, you, go ahead. Hi, good evening. So one of the issues is in our charter that we are required to take any new debt uh, such as a general obligation bond to the voters for approval before we were able to do that. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. You know, we would have to, the process would include uh, getting a new bond rating. Uh, we would work with our bond council. We would work with our municipal advisor uh, to help us get the funding that we needed. At this point, interest rates are not looking that great. We just were in contact with our municipal advisor and she's keeping her eyes out for some refundings but for newer projects that's probably not going to happen in the relatively near future oh, thank you for the clarification i appreciate that thanks gina okay uh mayor uh i don't know if you have any closing comments no i'd like to thank everyone tonight for going through the document to and the directors for sharing their uh issues or their projects with us. Um, the document is very extensive. I read it twice or three times since I received it. And I do have questions. Uh, and more of it's more about uh, some of the things that, that I that was talked about in this meeting. So I thank you for the questions that were asked. We have a, a monumental task ahead of us for the budget committee. And I'm looking forward to working with you through this process. 
And I think this is the first salvo into the waging into the bu um, budget my miasma. And so I'm hoping that we'll all uh, work together to come up with a budget uh, that will keep the city moving forward. So thank you, Marilyn, for the comments on the value of this document. That was wonderful. I appreciate that. And um, I hope you all have a great evening and hope you had a wonderful Easter. Peter? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all. Thank you. The world adjourned. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. hey. You didn't get to ask your question, Bill.